everybody. First of all, the, the purpose of the Strand is just sort of examine how key institutions in British society do seem to be in crisis. It's not the case that you have one institution in crisis. It seems that every rock-solid pillar of British society is under attack. Uh, it wobbles from one crisis to the next. Uh, it seems to be, you know, open to any criticism, uh, and individuals in charge of those institutions are also, you know, viewed with with intense uh, suspicion. And it can range from everything from the NHS, the education system, uh, to the police, to the family, to the church. You know, the, what we mean by an institution is obviously a body that has the pot potential to influence behaviour and also the potential to influence uh, society as well. And you do get a sense sometimes that British society can feel a bit rudderless when you have these once powerful institutions seem to be incapable of leading uh, and seem to be incapable of providing uh, British society with, 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 with direction. I think this opening session will hopefully provide an overview about the relationship between leadership and institutions and also how that connects with society. So you, with this session you're going to get an overview of perhaps what's driving the crisis within institutions and then for the rest of the day that will be broken down into looking uh, at institutions more specifically because there is an overarching if you like societal influence as to why institutions in, are in crisis but within that each institution has perhaps got specific uh, dynamics within it as to why they are unravelling and it I think it is a very substantial and serious issues I think as we saw with the 2011 uh, riots, we actually saw sort of a major institution kind of un un unable uh, and, and in some cases unwilling to actually deal with, with, with a serious situation. So this is not something that's going to go away. It's an, it's an ongoing process, I think, within British society. So just to give an example, the session I'm chairing right at the end on cops in crisis, what seems to be the matter officer, the plebgate debacle involve, involving Andrew Mitchell, it's still rumbling on. The Hillsborough uh, tragedy is still rumbling on in relation to the police. So this is not something that's uh, necessarily going to go away. And that's, that's effectively the purpose of this session, really. Why were these sort of rock-solid institutions that nobody questioned and had a huge amount of support in society uh, more or less floundering? And I think the serious ramifications uh, that will have uh, for society. So I hope you enjoy the sessions and I hope you enjoy the day. OK. Thank you very much, Neil. I'm Mark Taylor. I'm a deputy head at Addie and Stanhope Secondary School uh, in South East London. And uh, as, you will, as you've heard from Neil, uh, we're full of leadership programmes in schools at the moment and how we can develop leaders is a key thing. Some of my students are in the room and we're always being told how we can develop them as leaders as well. So I'm trying to pitch it with, uh, with bear in mind Neil's comments, but on the other hand, what do we do with young people what do we all do when we're looking to take responsibility? <coughs> what's the problem? Is, is the other way of looking at leadership. If what's the, point, uh, what's the point of it? What's the problem with doing something like that? OK, so that's me. The uh, first speaker then is Mike, who's just arrived. He's one of our major sponsors. He's the uh, chief executive or executive director of Jaguar Land Rover, uh, which he became in uh, December 2010. Um, as a member of the Jaguar Land Rover Executive Committee, He's focusing on developing corporate strategies to, develop, to, to deliver the company's growth ambitions. He's directly responsible for leading product and business planning, global financial services, government affairs, and corporate and social responsibility. He's got many other things on his CV, but because we want to get this debate running, I'll leave it there. Uh, so Mike's first. Then we've got Tracy Groves, who is also from our sponsors, Price Waterhouse Cooper. She trained as a uh, she was a, a trainee chartered accountant in 1991, but since then has developed her own leadership career, and is focusing on or specialised in behavioural train change to drive organisational effectiveness, helping business leaders incorporate integrity and ethics into their business thinking and leadership style. She leads the Price Waterhouse Cooper UK Integrity and Business Ethics mm -hmm. Capability as part of their government's risk and compliance leadership team and many other things as well. Uh, let's get on with the debate and take it up from there. Uh, then will be Robert Phillips. Uh, Robert is co-founder and head of chambers at Jericho Chambers and a visiting professor at Cass Business School London. His expert area is trusted brands, trusted companies and trusted leadership. He's currently completing a book called Trust Me, question mark, I believe that's correct Robert, yep, coming out uh, in 2014 and he's the co-author of Citizen Renaissance uh, 2008, 
and a frequent uh, discussant and speaker writer about issues connected to citizenship, leadership and trust. Uh, until 2012 December, he was president and CEO of Edelman, the world's largest public relations firm. Uh, so again, lots of other things on his CV and we'll take him up as the debate goes. Then we have on my left, Professor Catherine Riley. Uh, she's an international scholar and leading practitioner on leadership. She's been a teacher, held political office, been a national policy advisor and a local authority chief officer. Um, she's worked with UNICEF, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development and the World Bank, where she headed its effective schools and teachers group. And she's re a most recent publication was a book on school leadership or yes. leadership of place. Just happened to have it. About yeah. <laughs> okay. Leadership of place. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you may see different themes in the way these uh, people or uh, speakers address uh, leadership uh, as they develop their arguments. Finally, on the left, Neil Davenport is a former music journalist. Uh, he's been published in Metro, Select, Q, Uncut. Uh, he's a regular contributor to Spiked. He's contributed an important chapter to uh, a book called The Lecturer's Guide to Further Education, which is about the rise and rise of credentialism, uh, the idea that if you get a certificate, you're the man or the woman that matters. Uh, he's currently, though, Head of Sociology at the JFS Sixth Form Centre in Harrow, Middlesex, and teaches government and politics and sociology. OK, so we're, the title of the session is Great Leaders Born or Made. With no further ado, then, over to Mike. And, uh, good morning. What a terrific question, great leaders born or made. Uh, and uh, I've, I've immediately decided to share my perspectives from a people point of view, because also leadership is, you could say it's about brands, it's about other institutions. But I think most people in the room and generally are more interested in leaders as people and what people contribute to leadership. And I'm going to give you two perspectives. One very obvious one, which is business. Um, I'm involved in business, I've been involved in business all my life. Uh, through Jaguar Land Rover's history, we've had a number of different owners. So actually, we've, I've had a, uh, a great opportunity to witness not only different personalities of leadership, but also different nationalities uh, in terms of leadership, Americans, Germans, uh, and of course, at the moment, Indians. The other perspective I'm going to give you is as a fan, because I like sport. And uh, one of the th interesting things to me personally is if you, um, whether you like sport or not, actually the way in which people, particularly professional sportsmanship, stand up to the challenge of leadership, I think is quite interesting. So those are the kind of, if I hop about a bit, that's the, that's the reasoning behind it. I think the first point I'd make is the question is not how are great leaders made, but when are they made? And uh, if you look at examples through business or indeed sport, by and large, it's not the building up of a reputation, although that's important. There isn't an event that triggers uh, a moment in how we perceive those leaders to becoming great. Sometimes, it, quite often actually, it comes out of a crisis. Uh, something unexpected comes out of the crisis that we suddenly say, well, that was a tr we didn't expect that to happen. And the person at the forefront of that, uh, that, that recovery from the crisis suddenly becomes renowned for, for, for great leadership. And uh, I think you know, there are many examples in business and outside of business uh, that can categorise that. And uh, you know, one, one of the most interesting things of working in Jaguar Land Rover at the moment is you know, people are almost astonished by our success which is very nice, but it didn't come about by luck. You know, there was a lot of personal leadership at all levels through the organisation, which has uh, contributed to that, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, a bit later. The second aspect, or the second uh, question, is were they made? I mean, were, were leaders trained? Did they go through some sort of great educational process in the broadest sense of the word? Uh, or did they get it from experience? And uh, I don't think I'm compromising here but when I say it's probably a mixture of both. You know, clearly the great leaders that we think about probably had some technical or professional education in their life, but not exclusively. There are people who are great leaders in business who actually had very little business education in a formal sense. Um, they're probably great coaches. And what do I mean by great coaches? They are prepared to take the risk 
of allowing people to flourish, uh, allowing them perhaps to make a couple of mistakes. I mean, you don't want people making mistakes all the time, but they, they have a great capacity to bring the best out in the people that are around them. And in great corporations or in, in, in bigger institutions, you know, even though they're not directly accessible, they cast, and I'm sure we've all heard, the, the shadow of the leader. They cast a, a shadow over the whole organisation where people can identify with what the leader is doing. They're probably very comfortable with risk and uncertainty. You know, there's this great myth that all great business plans and all sporting campaigns, you know, there was the perfect plan, uh, it was written down, and all I can do is say, if you read a perfect plan, it's been written in retrospect. Mm -hmm. It hasn't taken account of all of the unexpected challenges that come along when you set a vision for a business or a team that you've got as a leader to overcome and find a way around. And increasingly in this day and age, in this world, those crises or those unexpected events can literally come, come through in minutes. You know, with the Twitter and all the rest of it, uh, you have to be able to react within minutes and hours, not days and months. And your capability to do that is something worth, worth thinking about. They also have probably some framework of control. Now, there's, I think there's, again, there's a, some myths about leaders, you know, they're absolutely manically in charge of everything, they're control freaks. Um, and indeed, some, some of them are. I mean, if you, if you accept that you know, dictators are great leaders, I'm stretching the analogy a bit, but they, clearly they have, a, they have a lot of control. But actually, every leader has some form of control or, or framework of control. Which, which allows people to understand the rules of engagement, what they're permitted to do. And I don't necessarily mean that in a hard metric-driven sense. It's what they're allowed to do as, if you like, sub-leaders of the business. So I'm just going to conclude. I'll give you two examples of who I think are interesting leaders. In sport, funny enough, in one of the papers today, there's a big article on Ferguson. And he, you can argue, was one of the great leaders of sport, and there are all sorts of myths about him. One of the most interesting quotes in that article is, one of my jobs was to maintain my energy even though I was feeling tired. Because if people saw, it, saw him being energy, energetic and passionate, that reflected over the whole organisation. Uh, and as a leader, you do go sometimes into quite dark and lonely places. But you've got to find a way of making sure you, the rest of your team, particularly in a crisis, don't go there. And finally... Um, Mr. Tata, I've had the great privilege of, of, of meeting Mr. Tata on a few occasions. On the one hand, a very humble man, very modest about his achievements. But when you meet him, he is absolutely clear and razor-like in terms of his expectation of a business. And there's no ambiguity whatsoever. And the other thing is, you go out of every meeting with Mr. Tata feeling that you can positively fulfill more potential than you had when you went into that meeting. He's got this great gift of giving you permission to deliver more. He doesn't have to tell you, he doesn't have to order you to do it, he just casts a great um, shadow and an inspiration of allowing you to go out and uh, uh, deliver. So that's my input. Okay. Thank you very much, Mike. Just think there are quite a few young people in the audience. They might not know who Mr. Tata is. He is uh, the chairman emeritus now of Tata Group of Companies, uh, who bought his 78. He bought, um, uh, they've got 98 companies around the world, and they bought Jaguar Land Rover from <coughs> Ford five years ago, which is how I've managed okay. to meet him. Thank you very much. Okay, second speaker, Tracy Groves. Thank you, Mark. Delighted to be here. And um, in thinking for my preparation today, um, I was very much encouraged by my colleagues at <laughs> PricewaterhouseCoopers to talk about my own personal leadership story. Um, and I went, oh, crikey, you know, do I do that? And how, what does that look like? What does, what does that feel like as a leader? So um, I took the plunge and went and actually asked some people. I went and spoke to some people that I lead within the firm, and I went to talk to clients that I work with. And I just wanted to give you two or three examples of what they came back to me with. The first one was when you articulated your dream and business vision for our team, Tracy, and what that would mean to each of us not just on a professional level, but on a personal level too. The second one was, when you proactively put our client in touch with your personal contacts, 
at a conference over in Washington because he knew nobody. The third one was, as a client who was going through a tough time, you noticed that I was distracted and you listened to me through a really hard period of my career by being so caring. And then the final one was, when you stepped away from work last year for four months to look after your husband who was seriously ill. We all know how passionate you were about your work and your clients and what it meant for you to walk away. These examples are all ones that I, I instantly recognised and I recalled very easily. Yet the overriding message I took from listening to those examples was that they were actually all relational rather than transactional. They all involved a, a very deep human interaction and connection. And that was telling me something which I already knew but just brought it to the surface yet again, that I lead by being me. For me, being true to myself, expressing my warmth and sense of purpose is how I influence and how I inspire others around me. My natural energy and enthusiasm reinforces my ability to motivate and encourage others around me. So back to the exam question, was I born or was I made in this way? So if we look at today's leaders, what they're doing is following a very long history of renowned figures and they're studied on leadership development programmes, on MBAs. And the problem I think with this personally is that we're so busy looking backwards and analysing others that we might be blocking our ability to unlock ourselves. What about our inner power and our unique sense of self? And let's be honest, leaders today are under intense scrutiny and pressure to be seen to do the right thing. In a world where there is no clear definition of, of what does that actually mean? What is the right thing to do? Whose judgment is being exercised to divine this, given the myriad of various stakeholder groups we are now playing into, and on what is it being based? I think we appear to be suffering at the hands of leaders who have placed their desire to be right above the desire to achieve the right outcome. And I just think, and I do wonder how powerful it would be if leaders were to stop acting as if they were great leaders and actually just focused on what their personal strengths were of not only themselves, but others around them as well. Personal branding appears to be held in more esteem today than authenticity. So my belief, and, and I see this many, many occasions, is that there is a fundamental disconnect between leaders today and the people that are being led. Behavioural science and research is telling us that we must recognise the importance of connecting with people before we try to lead them. And this is backed up in a recent Harvard Business Review entitled, Is it better to be loved or feared? And this challenges the primary characteristics of leadership and identifies both warmth and strength as the two primary traits of influence and the two chief dimensions of social judgment. Strength relates to agency and competence, whereas warmth includes empathy, compassion and trustworthiness. The research provides evidence that the way to lead and to influence is to begin actually with warmth. Warmth is the conduit of influence. It facilitates trust and the communication and absorption of ideas. Prioritising warmth helps you connect immediately with others around you bringing your humanity to the fore and showing that you understand that you care. The net outcome of this, borne out again by the research, is telling us that the resulting trust provides the opportunity for a leader to connect and to change people's attitudes and beliefs, and not just their outward behaviour. So the question is, can our leaders today easily manifest their warmth and connect with others compared to those leaders in the past? What has changed? And I think we have to acknowledge that the context of leadership has changed dramatically. Globalisation, technology, increased regulation, the, the, the volume and speed of change has changed human behaviour and, and our society. So for me, as, as long as being right is esteemed above showing humility, as long as ego is elevated above empathy, and as long as rhetoric holds more value than performance, then I think we are still a leadership in crisis. A recent survey by PwC on millennials at work, the generation born between 1980 and 2000, many of you may be here in the room, further backs this up. Millennials want a leadership style that is markedly different from anything that has gone on before. You want encouragement and recognition. You want to feel that your work is 
worthwhile and that you are valued. In other words, what you're looking for is a human connection. You're exhibiting the primary needs of feeling included and a sense of belonging. So where's this taking me then? In summary, and to wrap up here, I, I genuinely believe that leaders need to take a long and hard look at themselves, at their unique strengths and their sense of self, and not to agonise what others think about them or leaders in the past. We need to look forwards, not backwards, when it comes to developing great leadership. And leaders must reconnect as human beings and recalibrate their personal levels of warmth and strength in order to influence through their authenticity. So back to the question, are great leaders born or made? I actually think it's both. I think that we are all born with the capacity to act as great leaders. We all have humanity. We are all born with authenticity. But the risk is, is that we become in, unmade in a world where human warmth, connection and personal strength is not valued in our leaders of today. Thank you very much. OK, third speaker is Robert Phillips. Thank you. I'd like to pick up on some of the points that, that Catherine made, which I think are, are absolutely right. But to go back to, to, to where Neil started and the, the name of the sort of the, the, the day, um, institutions most definitely are in crisis. And that crisis is nearly always a function of failed leadership. And specifically, the failure of leadership to connect with warmth, with humility, uh, to the real needs and purpose of society. Uh, my work concentrates on leadership and trusted leadership in, in business. And I would argue that conventional leadership models are simply no longer fit for purpose. And that's because leaders have started to see power as their purpose, not common good. And there's a whole argument around that. I believe, and my Twitter handle, Citizen Robert, may give, a, give the game away, um, I believe that the new models that we need to develop are co-produced with regular people and are much more citizen-centric. So when we talk about charismatic leadership or situational leadership or servant leadership, I think they're dead in the water. I just don't think they have a place in the future. Co-produced, citizen-centric leadership, I think, is the logical response in an age of citizen-centric power. What do I mean by citizen-centric power? Well, the megatrend that, that guides all of our lives now, not just because of technology and communication, is that of individual empowerment. So we're seeing these power shifts take place from state to citizen, from employer to employee, from corporation to consumer. And within that trend of individual empowerment, that's why citizen centricity is so important. But what we get is a world that is increasingly atomized and activist. And we get power and influence that is actually much more asymmetrical than it's ever been before. So therefore, what do new leaders have to do well, actually, they have to think and behave like activists in order to meet an activist world. They cannot behave like pseudo rock stars or dictators, which is sort of what often happens uh, in the workplace. And elites are clearly fading, hierarchies are crumbling. And to quote Professor John Cotter, it's in networks, not in hierarchies, where the big changes happen. So if we want to change the dynamic of leadership, we have to look to networks of influence, not to old hierarchies. So these activist leaders need to co-produce their leadership models with real people, with networks of employees, with networks of citizens, with networks of consumers, with networks of regulators, whoever it happens to be. They can't just sit in isolated boardrooms or in advertising agencies and try and manage the message. They have to be visionary, they have to be empowering, they have to be transparent, they have to be democratic, uh, and they have to be transformational. And that democratic and transformational point I think is really important. Um, because basically they have to address what Occupy was digging at, which is we are the 99%. We cannot have leaders who only speak to the 1% and are part of the 1%. And if you switch that into popular culture, if you go on to the TV show Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, when someone asks the audience, they get the answer right 91% of the time. So asking the audience, asking the citizen crowd, combining your thinking with their thinking allows leaders to be the 91%, if not the 99%. And in doing so, I think you begin to realign business leadership, but political leadership also with the real needs and purpose of society. And finally, on this issue of trust and trusted leadership, citizen-centric leaderships understand one thing fundamentally, which is that trust and trusted leadership is an outcome, not a message. Now, most leaders 
historically stand up and make inane speeches about you must trust me because I trust you and other rubbish like that. They're just given speeches and they try and use trust as a message, not as an outcome or as a behaviour. So trusted leaders need to stop talking about trust and start earning trust. And the way to earn trust is through your actions, not through your words. And to your point, it is absolutely about doing that with humility, warmth and connection with regular people. So in business, which is the, the main area of my work, this means that leaders fundamentally will have to change their behaviours before they change their communication. And business leaders that don't change their behaviours will simply sleepwalk over the cliff. And the danger is they and their institutions will take society with them. Thank you very much, Robert. Fourth speaker, Catherine Riley. Thank you. Um, I come to our question from many routes, uh, as a teacher, as a researcher, as a policymaker, team leader from the World Bank, school governor and parent. I think that's taught me a lot about leadership. And I want to start with making three brief comments about what I call the leadership beast. First of all, I think the term is very overused. I, I'm told there's some 350 definitions and this assumption that if somebody has the title director of head of minister for this makes them a leader this is not the case secondly there's no one way of leading leadership is bound in culture and context and place and i learned this very strongly in vietnam where i began to see how communist and confusion traditions put a very different take on leadership from ones that we're used to here and my third sort of starter point on the leadership beast is this. I think there's a contamination in our thinking about leadership. We muddle leadership with management. Managers keep the systems rolling, and that's really important. And leaders ask, what are those systems for? And I want to just take us now, just very briefly, want to talk about what I call authentic leadership and what my term, what I call misleadership. Authentic leaders, I think as, as colleagues have already said, are humble, self-aware, they tell a story, they, they take us on a journey, this is where we're going and this is why we're going on it. They know that in this life today which is very liquid, very fluid, very uncertain, that place matters. And I learned this when I did the research for my book Leadership of Place, stories from the US, UK and South Africa. And in the book, there's some story, there are some stories of some great leaders, but they wouldn't think of themselves in those terms. And they have all stepped into that leadership um, space for a purpose, to make a difference. They focus on relationships, the point that Tracy was making. For them, they understand the importance of identity and belonging. They know what it means to be an outsider and they promote learning. And they don't fly solo. They make connections and they create spaces, bring people together in an archipelago of, of divided islands. And they work with impoverished communities. So Carla, for example, in um, downtown Brooklyn, who said, I'm here to help kids figure out their dreams. Now, the end result of this kind of leadership is that people leave a school or an organisation and they feel good and they take that positive legacy with them wherever they go in their life. But that's not the case with the misleader. Misleaders have a very different worldview. They are over-controlling, narrow, penny-pinching, fuzzy. And their legacy is often inertia, cynicism, fear and division. And those misleaders, whether they're in the banking sector, whether they're in industry, whether they're in schools, whether they're in newspapers, they fritter away this vital ingredient, trust. And I describe trust as the super glue that keeps society um, and communities together. So to begin to answer our question, I've covered a little bit on, on the leadership canvas. But in my view, I, I agree uh, with really what's been said that some, we're all born with that capacity to lead in some kind of way. Okay? Some opt into leadership because they see wrongs to be righted. Some because it pays and it's the way up the ladder. 
and psalm. There's that, that few that they have those kind of rare gifts of a hawk, almost like a hawk. They possess that marvelous capacity to appear to see to the future and to see the backwards at the same time. And they carry in their leadership the sunlight uh, on their feathers. And to us mere mortals, they appear to have the power of sight. And there's just a few of those around. Now, whilst I don't think you can teach everybody to fly, what you can do if people are open, if they take what I call their leadership pulse, if they're self-aware, if they think about the possibilities, if they're open, then they can become good leaders and maybe great leaders. But as to those misleaders, what I have to say there is those who do harm in the places where they claim to lead, we have to weed them out. My final point is this. When I did my research on leadership and place, I met this wonderful young woman called Mosa. And it was in the school that Nelson Mandela had gone to when he was a boy. And she said to me, I may be poor, like my president, Mr. Mandela, but I will work hard and maybe one day I will be the first black woman president of South Africa. And it seems to me that what we have to do is embrace nurture and nature and just looking at the wonderful young people here recognize the natural gifts that many young people have and maybe not carrying as much baggage as some of their elders and let's harness that let's bring let's let's take what they're born with with what we can teach them and let's create that cohort that group of, of authentic leaders our young leaders our future great leaders who reflect the diversity in our society who understand the social and the ecological challenges and who recognize the need that we all have deep in our souls to be rooted and to belong thank you okay thank you very much final speaker neil First of all, as I said in the introduction to the Strand, uh, if we look at political parties, the church, the BBC, the police and even the NHS, it is clear that once formidable institutions lurch from one crisis to the next, their influence is declining, individuals in charge of them are derided and they are viewed with utmost suspicion, uh, if not contempt. Such institutions, once pillars of British society and the British establishment, uh, was central to the future direction of British society. Now it seems they're directionless and vulnerable to any accusations thrown at them. In the case of political parties, they're simply empty shells of what they once were. And it begs the question, just to follow on from what Catherine was saying, whether fresh leadership, new leadership or young leadership can turn such institutions around uh, and make them powerful sources of influence and direction across British society. Uh, although schools, uh, the NHS and corporate companies are big on paying lip service to leadership and offer leadership courses for aspiring team leaders, the idea of leadership goes against the supposedly egalitarian everyone must have equal respect tenor of the times and I think this chimes in with what Robert was saying. As the Occupy protesters made clear a few years back, leadership is believed to be elitist, stuffy and potentially an imposition on the self-esteem uh, of the individual. To be told what to do, uh, even for a supposed progressive or radical cause, is considered an outrage for any self-respecting uh, young person. This automatic suspicion towards leadership, whether of individuals and institutions, uh, is also down to the rejection of authority, the acceptance and trust in others to give orders as a guiding principle in society. The decline of authority, powerful institutions, I would argue, has gone hand in hand with the rise of protecting uh, and recognising the emotional well-being and the potential victim status uh, of individuals people are in contact with. So I'll just give you an example in schools. Uh, I'd argue that the people with the most authority uh, within the education system is not necessarily teachers or even the headmaster, uh, but the child psychologist, special educational needs expert. These are the individuals who will safeguard a child's self-esteem uh, throughout their schooling years, and safeguarding that self-esteem has a higher source of authority than traditional authority mechanisms within the education system. This is true also amongst the legal system, the BBC, hospitals, the police, 
and politicians who make unguarded comments. Uh, individuals' fragile psychological states uh, have to be recognised by people in a position of leadership rather than people recognising somebody else's authority. What has happened uh, is that in order to be seen, to be connected with people in British society, such institutions have encouraged people to see themselves as potentially damaged, uh, in need of help uh, and support. But ironically, I think this has only had the effect of encouraging some people to make further demands for recognition and even recompense on institutions and effectively hold them to ransom. Often, uh, it is a perceived failure to recognise somebody's hurt feelings or have unwittingly caused offence that has destabilised many once rock-solid institutions in British society. But the sort of rise of assertive victimhood, is how I characterise it, against institu institutions uh, has also happened due to the absence of wider social solidarities that arose out of organic relationships uh, between key institutions and citizens in society. In the past, authority was actually based on an organic relationship with others and this established the legitimacy for decision making and provided the basis for real leadership. And I would argue, I think this is why leadership cannot be taught within or by institutions. Uh, if we take political parties, for example, they do not have a real uh, constituency to engage with others. You know, if you want to see a crisis of leadership, uh, you only have to look at Ed Miliband. So it is only by engaging with the masses of people do their decisions and actions become accountable. Uh, and it is only by being prepared to be accountable that real leadership can uh, emerge. So leadership has to have a relationship with the constituency and it has to have accountability as well. As such then, the genuine leadership can arise, can only arise when such organisations have a substantial vision of how society should be organised and the ability to take a large amount of people with you. Uh, it may also lead to a significant political opposition against such a vision as well. Indeed, the political battle between the wider British establishment and mass opposition movements in the past was what led to the creation of such institutions such as the police, the legal system, the BBC in the first place. The creation of institutions that contained such battles was how genuine leadership was formed uh, and thus cannot be taught or learnt. So leadership is only generated through a real struggle where something substantial is at stake uh, for either side. So I just want to finish off on, so for the last 20 uh, odd years the old leadership institutions of British society have been disorientated because they no longer have that political threat uh, through which to organise against. Real leadership was based on a battle to either safeguard the existing social structures in society or fundamentally change society. Ironically enough, it's the demise of any opposition or political threat in society which has had an unravelling effect on those institutions as well. Uh, whereas they once were vital to maintaining the status quo, now that empty shells devoid of their old guiding uh, protective purpose. The leadership of such institutions cannot be created with the right seminars and through the right powerpoints, but only through political struggle in wider society will people feel that something serious and significant uh, is at stake. Okay, thank you very much. Right, that's our uh, five introductory speeches, so I'm going to start with the audience. Behavioural psychology tells us again and again that we make really bad long-term decisions. How should leaders act when the 99% are wrong? Uh, so my question was around the, uh, the balance between uh, leading and making a decision and then listening. So if, if Mr. Tata has a sort of clarity of purpose and can give a uh, sort of no ambiguity, but then we've also got the sort of balance between the 91% and, and the other people. So it's, it's about how much you, you lead, but then in the end, and then you listen, but in the end you need to make a decision from what the panel think. At what point do you do that and what point do you just keep taking views and not making a decision. I'm not questioning the value of the sort of vision of leadership that you've uh, uh, outlined, each one of the speakers, but um, it doesn't seem to chime with me to what historically leadership has been seen as. I just wonder, when you think of the great leaders of history, Alexander, Caesar, um, you know, Mao, Putin, say. Interesting choice. Interesting, <laughs> well, yeah, interesting choice, but in the sort of traditional sense of what a leader has been, I mean, to, in many ways, you would have to categorise him as a great leader of many, many people. 
is there is there no place in the world yeah. for that sort of leadership anymore? Do you, would you say that those sorts of people yeah. are not leaders? I think uh, you're saying the panel have fudged the issue. That, of, I, I, yeah, I'm, really I'm not trying to say that, but yeah, yeah there, there's a very definite too perspective relational. on leadership, yeah. and I'm trying to try yeah. and put the other side. Good of for it. you. Good for you. Right. We've had all sorts of different ideas of what leadership's about. It's about making business a success. It's about making a team cohesive. It's about reorganising society and institutions. And what do you think the actual core of that leadership through those is? Uh, how much would you agree it's about making other people wanting to do what you want them to do? You mean manipulating them? <laughs> Not necessarily. If we go back to the sporting example, to inspire them to go to pull together to make the best of what they can okay. do. Thank you. Something that um, I was kind of expecting that wasn't covered in the are they born or made was the issue of gender. Uh, and this was more uh, aimed at Tracy. Do you think in your particular leadership style, your gender and being human, your gender has actually helped rather than hindered? So just to go back to something that Neil was saying, about the leadership courses, they're often very much about how to behave when you're in a leadership position rather than how to get there. Do you think there's a place in these courses that maybe we could uh, encourage people to develop their own authenticity uh, maybe and to build trust in a position where they can then go on to become a leader and use those skills? I just wanted to get the panel's thoughts on online leadership like Twitter and blogs and things like this as opposed to the old leadership of... Um, uh, inspiring speeches and um, the contrast and how that might change leadership going forward. The question is, uh, great leaders born or made? I don't believe anyone apart from Neil has really uh, addressed that. Where does leadership, well obviously look at it from biologists where I come from, it's intrasexual competition. It would, it's a form of dominance hierarchy. Can you say intrasexual? Intrasexual, that's within sex competition. Okay. Uh, dominance hierarchy is always either male or female, and obviously it's much more characteristic of males. Work organisations are hierarchical for a reason because it's essentially a male organisation. And you, the nature of in-group and group psychology is dichotomous according to sex. So you've got an immediate question then, a male leader is going to be very, very different to a female leader. All the rest of the panel, apart from Neil, have really talked about um, relational stuff rather than leadership. So I'll start with Neil first. OK, I just want to address the first question of uh, leadership in relationship to if the 99% uh, are wrong. I think what used to happen in the past when um, activists had failed to win people over, it was always very easy to sort of blame them and to blame them being brainwashed by the media and to blame their own stupidity. I would say that's very bad leadership because in the sense that leadership, you, you, <coughs> real leadership would say actually we weren't, very good, we weren't good enough with the arguments. So your hypothetical situation, if the 99% uh, are wrong or the 99% don't agree with your views. Good leadership would recognise we failed to win them over, we failed and therefore we would need to sort of work out better ways of winning the arguments. That, that, that's how I'd say that first one. Uh, to the gentleman who gave a roll call of interesting uh, mm -hmm. historical leaders, well I, I think I, I touched upon that towards the end of my introduction in the sense that real leadership is forced when something substantial and real is at stake. You know, uh, in, in some, it, it could be over uh, resources, it could be a life or death situation as well and, and leadership is forged in that way and I think the, a lot of the leaders that you've, you've touched upon, they, there was something very substantial uh, at stake, it wasn't managerial, it was you know, something that would have dramatic consequences for the people involved in that struggle so I think that's where uh, real le leadership actually comes upon. Uh, I think the gentleman over there touched upon a, a really interesting point about the issue of authority because authority does go hand in hand with leadership. It's the, the capacity to get people to do something that they might not necessarily want to do, but they actually accept, you know, your legitimacy to to give those orders. And I think that's, and I think what people in leadership situations are up against today, which is what I touched upon in the introduction, is that the higher authority is the self-esteem of the individual, and the psychological state of the individual is now the higher authority. And I, th I think um, Robert touched upon this as well in terms of individualism uh, and, and kind of uh, angry activism around individualism. Uh, I think that's one of the, the fundamental things that's changed, is that you have to respect the authority of somebody's potential fragile psychological state. That trumps everything. And I think that's why a lot of these institutions and leaders in those institutions uh, become unstuck. OK, thank you. So an emerging theme seems to be this psychological relational side of leadership versus real politics and what that does to people. But that might just be me being biased and an arrogant old-style leader 
but we'll see how this develops next. Catherine. I'm just going to touch on uh, two things and it's really about leadership styles and context and time because I think it's important to recognise that there may be somebody whose leadership style is appropriate to a particular context. So, for example, you could say here Ch Churchill's ebullient style was appropriate to, to the wartime situation we were in. But what happened uh, after the war was that uh, people like m my father, who had made sense of all kinds of things and seen some horrific things, wanted a different kind of society, and they voted Churchill out. They didn't want... <coughs> They didn't want that person because this was about, about values and ideas and relationships. They wanted something different. So I think it's important to understand that and to also think about the legacy. And so when I think of leaders, I don't think of all those military ones. My list is, particularly having spent so much time in South Africa, is, is people like Mandela, Tutu, Gandhi. And I think about the legacy. And I'm always interested, what is the legacy that people lead, uh, leave as leaders? And the second thing I want to just focus on, because it's really where my heart is and my energy is, is what you do about it now. I don't believe that little one-off courses, I don't do one-off courses in leadership because I think they're a waste of time and I just don't do them. What I do do is I work in programs and developing future leaders from where they are, from understanding themselves and taking them forward. But my heart is really in developing young leaders. And in a lot of my work we've been, for example, in one big project, we train young people to be researchers. And the reason we did that was about future leadership. So, for example, we trained a group of young lads in a school in North London. They did research on relationships with the police. They did fantastic research on how many times black boys were being stopped by the police. They presented that research to the local police commander who was completely blown away by these boys standing and saying, we have interviewed all of the boys in our school and this is what we have told you. Now, if you're talking about training leaders and developing the capacity to lead, that, that way of working has, is developing in that school, and we're doing this in, in other kind of ways, is, is a way of developing leadership. Leadership is about that self-knowledge. Leadership is about stepping into a space. And I'm really interested in what we do and, and, and the opportunities, which I think are fantastic, um, to step into that leadership space. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sensing that every time a speaker now clarifies, they're sort of saying, this is my bottom line, as if they have got something else in there that isn't just about a skill, it's something to do with a moral or a purpose. But again, that's just my looking at it. From I'll give you my bottom right, line in a right, minute. Right, okay. Um, just, just as an aside, I think it's fascinating the, the talk about trust and plebgate in the police, and yet nobody's visiting what young black kids in South London trust in the police when they're not represented. So this is a battle between a political institution and the Metropolitan Police Institution. It forgets the real people who every day have their trust eroded by, by the police and by the state. And I think there's a, an important point there. In trying to bring all these um, strands together, I'd like to start in South Africa, move to Egypt, and end up in ancient Greece. Superb. So, so just as um, on, on South Africa, I, I had the honour of attending a, a dinner with uh, F.W. de Klerk earlier in the week. And, and people obviously talk about Mandela as a great leader, which of course he is. Where it's a hell of a brave leader that un, uh, dismantles apartheid. Mm. And sometimes we forget that it's the people that set the framework for change are the real transformers, not just the people who lead after transformation. The question at the top left there about uh, Mao and Putin, uh, Alexander the Great and Caesar, of course, there's lots of militarism in there. And part of the problem with leadership in politics and in business is that we use macho militaristic language the whole time to define great leaders. And I think that does run to the heart of the gender debate. Uh, in, in many ways. Egypt is an interesting example because there you let the democratic genie out of the bag, nobody likes it, so back in it went. Um, and you have to ask, you know, for the better, betterment of the Egyptian people, is the militaristic solution of the Egyptian army, is the controlling solution of the Egyptian army better for the common good? It's an important philosophical uh, debate that, um, that we want to have. I think that um, the, uh, the, the key for good leadership for me, and somebody asked about Twitter and, and social media, is about listening and participation being the first step towards good leadership. So in the 1% addressing the 99%, in the hierarchies uh, speaking down at people the whole time, they tend not to listen, they tend not to participate, and that doesn't inform their thinking. So I would struggle to understand why the 99% would be wrong, 
because it seems to me that there is a statistical likelihood that they will be right. But the point about the 99% is, is that leaders need to understand what the sentiment is, what the direction of travel is, what the needs are to inform better decision making. And part of the problem is if you remain in institutional hierarchies and among elites, your decision making uh, becomes uh, uh, less good. And this takes me on to, to ancient Greece, because the one leader that we haven't thought of in all of this is Aristotle and the whole idea of thought leadership and virtuous leadership. So when the Greeks were sitting around rubbing olive oil into each other's backs and, uh, and contemplating the world, what were they talking about in terms of the nature of the polis, the nature of the state? And this is my bottom line. The polis, the state, was about the flourishing and well-being of all the citizens. It was not about the pursuit and the protection of power and authority. And therefore, the power and authority that has emerged in some of the institutional struggles that Neil talks about is not legitimized by the people. It's imposed from above. It's not led or created from within. So I would argue, to answer this gentleman's question about whether leaders are born or made, I would say leadership is born in the polis, in the common good, the common flourishing of all citizens. It is made in the polis and it is sustained in the polis. And by doing that, you have properly legitimate authority, not the illegitimate authority of the misleaders. Really interesting. I thought long and hard about bringing it up in my, my opening words, actually, and I decided not to because I was actually intrigued and curious to know if it would come up naturally, and I, I'm delighted that it has, actually. We've done a lot of research on this um, in the firm, and it's something we take very seriously, and there's an acknowledgement that there is a gender gap, not only in, in the work that we do uh, with our clients, but also within ourselves as well. And we work very closely with Professor Roger Steer, a corporate philosopher, he calls himself, and a visitor at CAS Business School. In fact, Robert, you, you might even know him. He's done a huge amount of, of work around ethicability and leadership. And his research is telling us that there are 10 moral values which drive decision making um, in, in when we go through life, uh, whether it's in our family life or in our work life. And uh, based on his research, psychometric tool based on psychology, the core value of love is the overriding driver for women when it comes to making decisions. Yes, we will also use the other drivers, but that is our core um, default position. With men, it's two things. It's wisdom is their number one driver as a moral value and a sense of purpose. Um, and I think it's about saying none of us, neither of us are right or wrong. It's about what is our, our natural default in terms of our DNA, the way that we are wired. And I think it's about acknowledging we need to embrace that as a positivity um, in terms of how we make decisions and consider how we allow all of those 10 moral values to be part of a balanced environment in which we therefore grow as leaders. The second thing I wanted to pick up, uh, apart from the diversity point, was the resilience point. And this comes to me when we talk about military leaders in the past. And in, in my head, what's common between us as leaders today and them is this resilience. If I think of Malala Yousafzai, the, the young Pakistani girl who was shot at the back of the, the bus going to school last year, I mean, she just inspires me. She is you know, fulfilling her dream and her ambition for every human being to have a right, particularly girls in Pakistan, to go to school. And girls and, and boys around the world are just fulfilled with this sense of purpose because of what she's doing and what she's saying. That must be driven by a sense of so much about what she stands for as a person and her resilience um, and her determination. And she's already, I think, publicly stated she wants to be Prime Minister of Pakistan. I'm going, go for it, girl. That's fantastic. You know, she's a future uh, leader for me in every sense of the word. So what's she doing any differently to Aristotle or anyone in the past? I don't think any differently. I think she's showing her humanity and her resilience in her ability to communicate and to engage others around her. Just picking up on a couple of uh, leadership uh, courses and how do you, uh, you know, develop young leaders particularly, um, it may surprise you to hear that as far as we're concerned, you know, institutionalised leadership development programmes um, increasingly have a lot of limitations more than advantages. You know, the, the, a company like ours, and forgive me for repeating what I said earlier in the opening session, you know, we have a huge, in our 22,000 employees in the UK, we had a, have a huge diversity of age, nationalities, sexuality, um, experience, and uh, you can't kind of spot the young leaders of the future by just taking a 
sort of framework. A lot of companies used to have the company X way and try to, try to deploy that through your people and say, you know, salute the flag and develop. The challenge now for business, largely because of some of the issues that we, we've spoken about, you know, it's much more open. You have to listen not only to your employees, but you have to listen to your customers. And I don't mean that in a sort of um, complicit sense. I mean genuinely listen to what they say. Our customers in California have a very different view to our customers here in the UK, for example. So how do you develop a system that allows all of those inputs to come in and for the business to make the right decisions? And I, I agree, somebody mentioned the distinction between management and, and leadership. There is a big distinction there. But people expect leaders to, at the end of the day, do two things in our view. One is they have to inspire people to deploy whatever the whatever the, um, the decision is. And hopefully the decision is the right decision. And certainly uh, in, in business, which is getting quite a bit of a bad rap at the moment for all sorts of reasons, I think there is a revolution going on that's saying, you know, we can't just have this perceived hierarchical view. The inspire, I think if you've got all the inspired CEOs of today on this panel, very few of them would say that the reason they're a CEO is because they've got the power. They would say that it's because they, they have a certain leadership skill that allows them to bring the best out of the organisation and the people within the organisation. The second thing is this bit about new, new communication technology. In my experience, nothing replaces anything. It just adds to the mix. So is the need for a really good... A piece of oration or speech in a leader's sort of arm, armory, if you like, going to be replaced by the need to be able to be a really good blogger, or I, I don't think so. He probably needs or she needs to be able to do both and, and talk to the fragmented uh, communication systems that leadership has on offer now. And finally, on the gender thing, you know, we have a really interesting challenge as, a, as an engineering company because actually. You, if you do a head count, you say, well, you, you haven't got many female engineers in your business. Um, the real challenge for us, and, and one thing that we're working extremely hard on, and it goes right to schools, it goes right to the education system, it goes right to expectations, is actually we do need more female engineers. They offer, as Tracy said, a diversity and a difference, particularly in des design and engineering. And, and, and our challenge is how do we develop uh, the expectation for people outside of our industry to, to believe that actually engineering and design in an automotive company for somebody who isn't a male actually is a very, very legitimate career. And that's a huge leadership challenge. Mm. Okay. This gentleman, I think, uh, it's Robert, isn't it, mentioned the point that um, good leaders should listen to the 99% of the people that they're addressing. But isn't the real problem that it's the 1% of the people who have the real power in society in terms of money, influence, and um, being able to tell other people what to do. I just wanted to ask how you feel public scrutiny and media scrutiny affects leadership now. Um, you mentioned about, especially political leaders, Ed Miliband. There was a, a media narrative about his leadership before he even became leader of the Labour Party and should we not really be looking at the whole front bench of the Labour Party because they're, they'll be, form the cabinet, they'll be the ones who lead us. Um, and also, you know, the BBC, uh, the National Theatre, the England manager this week, we're, we're kind of, you, you were painted a picture by the media of very specific things that aren't necessarily their entire leadership style. Okay. Just carrying on from the gentleman's point over there, we've heard a lot about um, the necessity to build trust, say, say in private enterprise, so a good leader is a caring leader, someone who can connect with people's feelings, someone who has empathy, but is this a really a good thing? Can we really have caring leadership under the current economic system? Is it a perceived hierarchy that we see, or is it a real hierarchy? Where actually some people are bound in certain economic conditions in which their leaders aren't. So you want less empathy? It's a question. Is it real? Em can we have oh, real empathy? That's a very unusual point to hear these days. We've talked about the nature of leadership and styles of leadership today, but I wonder whether there's a, a prior question, which is, does anyone want to be a leader today, in fact? Uh, and 
Tracy, it was really refreshing to hear uh, you being so confident, actually, in the way you told your story and how you see yourself as a, as a leader. And that's quite unusual, I think, often today, because there's a seems that there's quite a defensive attitude to leadership and authority, uh, almost a retreat from leadership among younger people. Uh, and so I just like your comments on that, really, whether there's a, a prior question before we come on to talk about what makes a good leader as to whether anyone wants to do it anymore. I wanted to talk about female leaders. I think the problem when we talk about female leaders is people just assume a female leader is, when they think about female leaders, they think of things like compassion and patience and things like that. But I think those are skills that any leader should have. If you don't have compassion, you can't call yourself a leader. And I think it comes down to having charisma, having a definite a character. You need to, because a lot of people who want to be leaders who take these courses to learn how to be leaders are, are taught how to interpersonal skills, but you need to have vision. And the problem with it, a lot of leaders nowadays is they don't, they're not culpable. They're not saying this is what I want and this is the direct direction we should go in. And when things go wrong, they don't take responsibility. Like you say, they blame it on all oh, this happened, this happened. Just say, this is what I believe in and this is where we should be going. Do you think that there's leaders that are caring but they're scared to show it mm -hmm. because they might see that as a weakness like in my I work for JLR actually and I'm happy being engineer so I think I tick the boxes <laughs> but it's just sometimes with the, it's the point to be feared or loved if you are feared you get results if you are loved <laughs> you get more results because people are willing to go off the limits to give you more so What's the status there? Just very quickly, someone who's not been mentioned, and I'd be intrigued to hear your thoughts, uh, is uh, Steve Jobs, as he flies in the face of quite a lot of what we've heard about leadership and empathy and trust and that kind of thing to people. Uh, just to um, develop the gender thing a little bit more, the usual assumption is male bad, female good. But of course, uh, alpha males, and this is, uh, this is true in, across uh, animal species as well, uh, tend to it really see themselves as serving others and diffusing conflicts. And the big problem a leader, leader has to face is how to deal with irreconcilables. And then when you move on to, to female leaders, you've got a problem. Uh, in human groups, female and male in-group psychology are totally different. Male in-group psychology is to identify symbolically with the whole group, as in the work group, this, uh, this is, males are embedded in a, in a hierarchy where females are in chains of personal networks and uh, this is why females hate female managers because of course the female in-group does not identify with the whole in-group, it's just their personal favourites and that's a fundamental problem with uh, female leadership. Okay, so the fundamental problem with female leadership is now on the table. I'll be quick because I just want to manly and vehemently disagree with the last guy <laughs> and uh yeah and say that um i am a woman from the neck down and um, i really do think we have to nip in the bud this idea about biological determinism in any it's sort it always crops itself up in all of the e every debate these days it's a contemporary uh, uh, I think very bad because it takes us back to us thinking about you know women are emotional and nurturing or or something like that or what you said about female leaders and I don't like a female leader it's absolute <laughs> rubbish um, and I also think that I'm a bit confused with what you're saying on the panel because I really like the idea apart from Neil actually I really like the idea of you saying it's about context and it's about the time but actually we, it, it feels like we are all so, so still trying to say you have to be compassionate or you have to be that to be a leader and I've been led by a lot of people some of them bastards some of them very compassionate but they've actually got vision couldn't agree more with you in there I'll shut up in terms of like whether you can be made a leader or like you're born a leader how far do you think a basic education is necessary combined with natural talent or IQ so maybe not specific yeah. like leadership training but actual straightforward education yeah um with the gender thing do you think the actual gender stereotypes we have and this whole psychologizing of men and women are actually really unhelpful i would just like to perhaps position the fact that one thing that hasn't come out in the discussion is the context of the organization so organizations which have uh, a very compromised context uh, shareholders voters customers um, where that diversity actually makes it very difficult to, to put forward vision. Um, potentially handicaps leadership, whereas an organization that has a clarity of purpose 
makes leadership that much more easier and allows leaders to flourish. Okay, I've got 10 students in the back row and they're in year 10 in my school and I want to know from the panel if you could consider answering this. Should I tell them to go for prefects and head girl, head boy in the year coming up because that's what we normally do or should I just relate to them and see what happens? Should I like say, you know, it's there, go for it or am I just sort of tinkering around and I should just let them see what happens, okay? You don't have to answer that, but I'm curious. <laughs> right. I just want to sort of push my point a little bit further about um, people being wrong. So I agree with Neil, uh, uh, with Neil that if uh, leaders haven't persuaded or communicated the decision that leadership has failed, um, I would ask the panel to humour me in the concept that we could make poor long-term decisions as a group of people and would ask how far, a s slightly different question, how far should leaders push or how far should they go when they believe that they are doing something that is right even when the vast majority think that it is wrong or feel that it is wrong? Yeah, I'll tackle the year 10 first. Yes. Have it, have the, take the opportunity if you think it's right now is my, is, is my personal advice. Um, I think one of the problems with, with this question, or one of the, the, the thoughts it triggers, is there isn't a predetermined way to develop leadership. If you think you're right for it, take the opportunity now. If you don't do it, that doesn't mean in future you're not going to be a great leader. Um, so it's, it's take the opportunity. To the gentleman who talks about you know, the, the myriad of stakeholders organisations have in them, I think that is really the sort of nascent current challenge for leadership. If you're going to be a great leader, you have to be able to determine a purpose and a vision within all of that complicated context. And my bet is it's going to get even more complicated, you know, in the future. It means that, you know, the established model of leadership and what it was may have been sort of 10, 15 years ago or in the last century or right at the beginning of civilization. You know, it is always going to move on and it's always going to have to respond to the challenges of the future. I remember one of the great, one of the things we've spoken about is great leaders have a, a great capacity to determine what a future looks like for their, their constituents, this sense of purpose. So they have to live a lot in the future and determine what that means for, for indif individuals and you can argue a lot of the manifestations of weak leadership that we've got at the moment is because of that inability to clarify what the future is going to mean for the constituents in whatever. And finally, uh, I think it's a great point uh, the lady at the back made about uh, accepting responsibility. Um, personally, I do think that's a failing in leadership. It's not talked about um, very often on the limited number of courses I've, I've been to recently. Um, and it's a, it's a responsibility of if somebody makes a mistake or it has had an um, impact on a, a, a negative impact, that it is the leader at the end of the day who has to accept the responsibility even if they weren't directly involved. And sorry, one final, final point about time. Forget business, forget politics, think about natural disasters. And uh, I've been lucky enough to witness some of the, the, the great people that work on natural disasters in the, in the environment. They don't have time to make up their mind. And people who are working in these natural disasters to save human lives, to recover the situation, have to make instant decisions. And even that, in that environment, there are leaders who stand up and give people clear, unambiguous direction to solve the short-term problem that may be seconds or minutes away. It's not, you have to do that all the time, but that is one essential fact of leadership. So I got asked, um, why would I want to become a leader in the first place? And uh, is there potentially both males and females out there demonstrating, or not demonstrating, and scared to show their compassion and their warmth? Um, for me, I look back over my, my journey in life, um, and I, I was questioning myself, when, when did I decide to become a leader? Uh, and I never took that decision. <laughs> It wasn't a conscientious choice that I made. It just kind of happened. So whether it was um, head of fifth form, head girl at school, command post officer in the Territorial Army, so I was in charge of the, the guns and the uh, angle and the ammunition rounds, 
uh, through to becoming a partner in PwC, um, it's happened. And, and that's because I genuinely believe um, I was brought up in a family where you, you are the best that you can be. That, that's really my philosophy in life. Whether I look different, sound different, think differently, feel differently, I actually don't really care. I really value the diversity of people having a difference of opinion. And at times, I recognise the need where other people have strengths other than me, and I bring them in to help me lead. Because we can't be all things to all men and women at all times. And it's that sense of humility, I think, which has empowered me um, and helped me. So um, why would I want to be a leader? Because I want to be the best that I can be. Um, I love making a difference. There's nothing more satisfying and fulfilling than seeing something which I could see as, as being quite minor, having a, a huge impact on other people's lives and their businesses, ultimately. And, and for me, that is being who I am. That's what drives me as a as human being. That drives me as a wife, uh, as a sister, as a daughter. So to me, it's about be the best that you can be. And if you want to be a prefect or a head girl, I can only thoroughly recommend it. <laughs> but I would say you don't need a label to be a leader. If you want to go on to the next year, whatever it might be, go on and be a leader. Yeah, whether that means you're in the netball team, the rugby team, or whatever it might be, just be yourself. Well, my advice to, to year 10 is to mutualize the prefecture and to form a cooperative. Um, so, so there's some food for thought. Um, there's been a lot of talk about gender diversity and to a serious, well, that was a serious point about year 10, but to the second serious point about year 10, is about age diversity. And I think we miss the opportunity when we should be arguing that leadership can skip generations. So this whole idea of just hand me down leadership, sort of dead men or dead women's shoes, usually dead men's shoes, is completely redundant. And we should be brave enough as existing leaders to invite new generations into the leadership model. And I think that's very important. Uh, in answering the various questions, I want to talk about probable futures, possible futures, and then why Margaret Thatcher is to blame for everything. <laughs> so, so in the probable future, I think this speaks to the 1%. I think it absolutely speaks to the 1%. We see power and influence resting with the 1% because we haven't got the ability to crack it open. So therefore, we get stuck in the leadership of tomorrow being just another version of leadership we have today and believing in the 1%. And the whole point about democracy, growing democracy, whether it's through technology or otherwise, allows us to crack open the 1% and to be the 91% in the first instance and the 99% in the second instance. And I think that addresses the, the question about do we want to be leaders? Those of us who really believe in the progressive agenda, who believe in transformation, yes, we want to be leaders, and yes, we have a responsibility to be leaders, because if we don't take that responsibility, we won't change anything. And if we don't change anything, God knows what happens, not there's a God, but because we cannot go on like this, okay? The world, especially the British institutional world, is fucked, excuse the expression, and we have to find a way of changing that model from the 1% to the 99%. And yes, we might make mistakes in accepting leadership along the way, but we have to do that safe in the knowledge that we are doing the right thing, mm -hmm. doing what we believe is the right thing, which builds trust, but not just what the right thing is for us, which is where the 1% go wrong, it's what's the right thing for society and for everybody else. And that is why I blame Margaret Thatcher. Not just Margaret Thatcher, but in fact, all the mad market fundamentalists of the past 35 years. Because what they've done is they've taken the moral argument out of the leadership argument. They've taken away from the public discourse the whole idea of what doing the right thing is. And instead of saying, actually, there is a role for the state, actually, there is a role for active citizenship, they said, well, let the markets decide. You know, there's one book you should all read as a result of this, is Michael Sandel's What Money Can't Buy and the Moral Limits of Markets, because we cannot leave issues of citizenship and issues of leadership to the markets to decide, because mm -hmm. the markets do not always get it right. And I think that the latest question about, um, you know, maybe we shouldn't have empathetic leadership, I think that is a myth created by the Churchills and the Thatchers that it has to be strength, not empathy. And strength doesn't represent leadership. Strength represents strength, and they're two completely different things. So I think it's not just about empathy and compassion. It's not just about strength and military language. Ultimately, it's about co-creating leadership and about doing that with real people, regular people who live lives every day. I want to end on three points. Um, first of all, it's the big picture about leadership and the kind of leaders that we want to need. We need leaders and leadership that reflects 
the richness and the diversity of knowledge and experience in our society. This is not a token thing to say, oh, we have to have one woman on the board, we have to have a black person on the board. This is just to say, wow, look at, look at the social capital, look at the richness that we have in our, in our community. Look at London and this diverse, fantastic city. Let us make sure that we do everything to create the leadership space so that people from different backgrounds feel that they can step into it. Now, I wasn't going to mention this, but I was, some years ago, the first woman on a chief officer board in a local authority, and the other, and were 13 men and me. And I have to say, it was probably the worst and the best experience of my life. It was awful, 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 in that the chief exec didn't want me there. I would speak and he would ignore me. It was a horrible experience. However, working with some of the men, all white men, we began to change that and we began to shift it. But I know how isolated and how difficult that was for me. We have to change the way leadership is constructed so that people can step into that space from very diverse backgrounds. Secondly, we do have a problem now of some people not wanting to step into leadership because what somebody was saying over there, you know, because of economic issues, you know, because of the way the economy is, because of the way of things are controlled by government. And what we have to do, and I'm really supporting what you're saying here, is say, you know what, if we get the right people, and if they are really working together and leading for a purpose, for the common good, just look what can be achieved. And so we have to encourage people to step forward. And you don't have to be that gung-ho, dynamic, fantastic person. Some of the best and the great leaders that I know are very quietly spoken, they're very diffident, and yet they lead in a wonderful kind of way, and we need to remember that. And finally, my comments to, to, to you young people at the back is, do take every opportunity, what your teacher offers and everybody else offers, to develop your leadership skills, capacities, opportunities. Recognize that being a prefect or head girl or boy, or whatever, is one way of leading, but there are so many other ways of leading as well in terms of particular campaigns, leading through the arts, leading through the media. So I would say, look at your place, your context yourself, and see where your leadership place is and recognize that for everybody, we all want to belong and to be rooted. And I think that is the fantastic, fantastic gift and opportunity that you young people can bring when you come into the whole leadership world and give us, give us your gifts and work with us to make the changes that are needed. Okay, and finally, Neil. Okay, a couple of things. I just want to pick up on something that Robert was saying about Sacha. I mean, I actually thought Sacha was uh, an example of good leadership and bad leadership at the same time. I think she was a good leadership in the sense that she had that old-fashioned Machiavellian approach to dealing with, you know, getting her agenda across. She was pragmatic when it needed to be and she was kind of forthright and decisive when it also needed to be uh, as well. And it, it's always slightly embarrassing that the left's response to Thatcher's leadership was to sort of throw out words, obviously just sort of macho nonsense, as I think some leftists actually said about the about Arthur Scargo, which is just all sort of uh, macho nonsense, we don't have anything to do with it. And I think what Thatcher actually, actually exposed was the crisis of the leadership on, on, on progressives uh, at that particular time. Uh, but Thatcher was also an example of bad leadership, and it's a sort of a sign of what happens when you undermine your own constituency and you chip away at your own support in society. Uh, because as we've, we've discussed already this morning, uh, leadership, uh, real leadership only has uh, uh, proper meaning when it has an organic connection with people and it's only through having an organic connection with people that you can have authority uh, and legitimacy to actually uh, uh, make decisions. Somebody was saying about whether leadership should display emotion. Well, uh, again, ironically enough, for, for some leaders, that's been the way through which you try to create new sources of authority. So uh, uh, Tony Blair, at any given uh, situation, would make sure his eyes would be welling up and he'd be blubbing over uh, Princess Di. Why did he do that? Because he was you know, instinctive enough to realise this was the way the wind was blowing, that, you, that his authority was trying to tap into the authority of emotion and to tap into the authority of sort of uh, psychological damage. And, 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 but I think we actually, obviously, we need sort of far less of that. And that sort of emotional scrutiny goes back to the other question regarding, you know, media scrutiny. But again, media scrutiny and oppositional scrutiny is not necessarily about decision making and the outcome of decision making, because that's what real scrutiny should be about. Too often, uh, the scrutiny is actually about etiquette and manners whether they have said the right word, uh, whether they have made an inappropriate uh, joke. 
as what happened with Roy Hodgson this week. So that's what scrutiny is about. Scrutiny is about making sure that your etiquette is correct, rather than necessarily that you're the political decisions that you've made are actually the ones that are worthwhile for society. Thank you very much. OK, we've, uh, we have finished, but before we go, uh, unless you're staying for the next session in here, I'm going to ask a quick question. Put your hand up, please, if you think great leaders are born. <laughs> That's not exactly a majority. The 99% aren't here. And if you think great leaders are made, more, and some combination, Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> we probably asked the wrong question. Okay, so uh, we hope that the, this session has given you a flavour for the rest of the day. We've raised a few questions. Can we have a round of applause for the speakers, please? <laughs>